Hello folks and welcome to today's webinar, Composting Recipes and Integrating Food Scraps with James McSweeney. This is the third webinar in the on-farm composting and compost use webinar series. I'm Linda Bilson Brolis of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance's Composting for Community Initiative and I'll be your facilitator for today. A quick shout out to a couple of my ILSR colleagues who are helping with the series. Sophia Jones will be providing technical support throughout the webinar and Clarissa Libertelli is a talented artist who's creating beautiful artwork for a composting initiative, including this beautiful graphic. So thanks to you both. Uh, for those not familiar with our work, ILSR's Composting for Community Initiative is advancing composting to reduce waste, enhance local soils, create community development opportunities, and to protect the climate. Our focus is to catalyze distributed food waste composting options that include home, community, and on-farm scales. You can find out more about our work and peruse our wealth of resources, including reports, infographics, webinars, podcasts, and a policy library and map on our website. If you go to ilsr.org forward slash composting, you'll see a composting resources drop down menu on the right hand side of the screen. This series is being brought to you through our involvement with the Million Acre Challenge, of which ILSR is a founding member. The Million Acre Challenge is a collaborative project with the mission of advancing regenerative agriculture on 1 million agricultural acres in the Mid-Atlantic region. If you're just joining us, uh, the first webinar in the series featured Dr. Robert Rink, who showed us the many different options for on-farm composting systems and the configurations that exist. Uh, in, the last, uh, in the last webinar, Ellen Polishuk uh, did a deep dive into how she used a specific windrow composting method that helped her improve her farming business in Virginia. Today, we'll be learning the ins and outs of developing composting recipes and managing composting feedstocks commonly found on farms. Best management practices for the composting process are a common thread throughout these first three webinars, as our prior priority is fostering the creation of high quality compost. The final three webinars in the series will focus on what to do with the compost once you have it and the potential benefits and considerations for compost use. We've made a few tweaks to our upcoming webinars, so check out the lineup on our website. The next webinar will be on October 26th and will feature strategic advisor and healthy soil advocate, Calla Rose Ostrander, and the director of the Cornell Waste Management Institute, Jean Bonatal. They will present the latest on the benefits composting provides to the soil, plants, and the climate. You can register for that session on our website. Uh, but now we're going to get to know each other a little with some interactive polls. So get ready to participate using the GoToWebinar control panel on your screen. Uh, okay, so the first question, where are you participating from? Are you participating from the Northeast? Northeastern US, Southern US, Midwestern US, Western US, or are you outside of the US? I'm gonna give you just another few seconds. Alrighty, let's see where everybody's from. So majority from the Northeastern US, but a pretty good spread for all the other categories. Welcome to everyone. The next question, are you composting? Uh, yes, you're already composting. No, but you're interested in starting. Uh, no, you're interested in supporting others in composting or other. And if you select other, if you wouldn't mind entering in the chat what that means. Sweet, just a few more seconds. Alrighty, vast majority already composting, that's awesome. Um, hopefully we'll be giving you some tools to just improve uh, your composting operation. Um, and those that are not composting yet, hopefully this will give you a, what you need to get started. All right, so just one last question. What best describes your affiliation? I know you all filled this out in the registration, uh, but just so you all can see who's on the line. Farmer, composter, farm service provider, and I know researcher, government, and nonprofit, that's a very big category, um, and then other business or other. And again, if you're 
in the other category we'd love to see in the chat. All right, just one more second. All righty. So we got an even mix of farmers and composters and a good mix of other folks. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you everyone uh, for participating and welcome, welcome to the webinar. Um, Ready. So uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague at the Institute um, and the director of the Composting for Community Initiative, Brenda Platt. And she's going to tell us about a very exciting bill that's currently before Congress. So hello, Brenda, take it away. Hello, Linda. Hello, everybody. So um, I'm just going to spend a few minutes just on this. Um, if you could put up my first slide, that'd be great. Um, on the Compost Act, it's, um, is it showing for everybody? It's not showing for me. Yeah, the comp, thank you. Okay, the Compost Act, and it stands for, we did not come up with this, Cultivating Organic Matter Through the Prom Promotion of Sustainable Techniques Act, and it was introduced this summer by U.S. Representative uh, Congresswoman Julia Brownlee from California, and on the Senate side by Cory Booker from New Jersey, referred to the House committees in uh, both the House and the Senate. And go to the next slide. The key highlights of this bill is it does really two things. First, I think importantly, it designates composting as a conservation activity, which would make it eligible for funding from USDA's conservation programs. But secondly, it would establish a grant program and loan guarantee program for projects that expand composting infrastructure, mostly infrastructure, and it would allocate $200 million a year over a decade, that's $2 billion total. And one of the things that um, the Institute for Local Self-Reliance worked hard with other stakeholders was to ensure that that funding flows to projects of all scales and sizes, not just large-scale centralized facilities. Um, the next slide uh, kind of gives an idea of, of how the bill would promote a diverse infrastructure. It includes provisions um, that would include projects that for farms that are applying compost application as well as systems that are on site, whether it's a farm or a convention center or university or school. So it doesn't have to be um, collecting your organics and taking it elsewhere. Um, we did a carve out of at least 50 million per year for non-centralized, non-commercial projects, and those are defined as compost sites that are producing 10,000 tons a year of finished compost or under. And then for priority funding, instead of it priority funding going to large-scale sites, which does happen in some states, you know, they were like, oh, the, the bigger your site, the more food scraps you divert, et cetera, then we're going to prioritize funding for your project. And as a result, a lot of that infrastructure money goes to like $3 million projects. So we wanted to do things, really push for something different here. So projects that support underserved communities or engaging BIPOC-led farms and businesses, incorporating small and diverse businesses and other things would qualify as for priority funding. Um, this bill was pushed by the U.S. Composting Infrastructure coalition and as the next slide just shows just some of the founding members of this in addition to the institute for local self-reliance ilsr u.s composting council biodegradable products institute um, and others have been at the table pushing this and again i just want to emphasize that we played a pivotal role in the development of this bill to ensure support for composting at all scales and sizes and for diverse equitable projects. And then the last slide um, I'll just wrap up is, you know, take action. It's um, really probably gonna be teed up for the farm bill, which starts next spring. I think we will blink and we'll be, we'll be talking about the Farm Bill next spring for 2022 when it gets introduced in the 22 legislation. There is some funding for this that's been referred to Ag Committee that's in the budget reconciliation package, but there's so much trimming that's going to need to happen with that in order, um, you know, for that to get passed. So really it is important to, um, you know, help contact your elected officials and help publicize the act. So do what you can. Um, 
and hopefully we'll get more direct funding to farmers and others to do more composting. Back to you, Linda. Awesome, thank you, Brenda. Um, so yeah, everybody uh, get in touch with your representatives. It's an awesome opportunity. Um, but now, uh, before we begin our feature presentation, I just wanted to take care of some housekeeping notes. As you probably have noticed, everyone's in listen-only mode. We will be holding questions uh, for James until the very end, but please enter them as they come up into the GoToWebinar control panel. Um, this webinar is being recorded and a copy will be sent to you as soon as it's available. Um, if you are a farmer and you paid for this webinar by mistake, please let us know um, either in the chat or by email so that we can refund your registration fee. And with that, uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Uh, through his work at the Highfield Center for Composting in Vermont and his current consultancy, Compost Technical Services, James McSweeney has worked with hundreds of composters, large and small, on everything from site planning, design, and management to compost heat recovery and livestock feeding systems. He co-authored Growing Local Fertility, a guide to community composting with our Brenda Platt, who you just heard from. Uh, with a background in agroecology and permaculture, Restoring e ecological in integrity to our local farm and food systems is at the heart of James's work. So without further ado, uh, James, uh, I'm gonna hand the controls over to you. All right, looks like I'm live and I'm just gonna take a second to figure out how to get to my slideshow. Let's see. All right, looks like we're here. Okay, let me know if-, if um, We don't see your screen just yet. Oh, don't. I see it. Yeah, it's, it's up. Did it come? Okay. Awesome, well, hello, and, and thank you all for being here. Um, and I wanna first thank Linda and Sophia for coordinating and hosting this composting series. And of course, Brenda Platt and the entire amazing team at the Institute for Local Self-Reliance. Um, for those of you who may not be as familiar with their work, they're playing a pivotal facilitative role nationally um, in keeping organic materials local and advocating for keeping high quality organic materials high quality um, <clears throat> so they can stay in and play a generative, a regenerative and um, a role in the food system in, in our communities. And I also want to applaud the efforts of the Million Acre Challenge and give a quick caveat, which is that I generally can't speak about the climate crisis publicly. Um, it's, it's too emotionally charged for me. Um, <clears throat> but I do want to acknowledge the important role that farms are going to play as they adopt and improve soil health practices. And I'm excited to learn the latest science about compost and its soil health building superpowers from the upcoming presenters. Um, so I wanted to start my presentation by taking the opportunity to add um, my two cents <clears throat> regarding on-farm composting's role in the compost production side of things. And um, it's, it's a conversation that a lot of people have been having for a very long time um, uh, you know it makes sense to most farmers and most people who advocate for on-farm composting that um, com farms are a good place to be composting but that doesn't necessarily translate to everyone else out in the world um, and so I just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about my understanding of some of the barriers uh, there's definitely we need more information about the economics um, of composting and integrating composting on farms. Um, <clears throat> and there is always going to be this balancing act between the cost of production of compost and quality, meaning um, more energy, more cost um, is, <clears throat> is, is, is needed to make a certain quality of compost, which I think um, I'm going to be advocating for, but there's, yeah, I mean, there's also, you can make compost really cheap and sometimes that can actually create a lot of problems. So um, that's where, you know, nimbyism uh, can, and, and, and bad actors, people who aren't doing a great job 
can really create big problems for all the all the composters or future composters around them. So um, there are issues that that can be created by composting, obviously, and and we want to be um, promoting the benefits and and making sure that people out there are seeing the benefits. Um, there's all, also this challenge in navigating the regulations, or some regulations are just purely inhospitable to um, small-scale composting in general, um, or just unclear. Um, quality in organic materials, meaning contamination, which I'll talk a bit about today, is can be a big issue. So getting clean enough material that farmers want it, and, um, and having technical support with all of the above. Um, <clears throat> so on the strengths opportunity side of things, I think one of the big things that I go to is that farms have a lot of existing equipment and infrastructure that they can leverage and lower the startup cost, um, the startup and, and, and keep production costs lower. Um, there is generally not a shortage of organic materials out there. Um, and there are lots and lots of models on the collection of organics, particularly food scrap comp compost, food scrap collection that are both um, are quite profitable. And so um, that side of things is is definitely a big opportunity. It may not be the right thing for all farms to be doing that, but certainly there's a lot of material, a lot of places that haven't even touched touched the available material out there. Um, there are system options, a lot of the stuff that, that Bob Rink talked about, models for most scenarios um, to make some form of composting work on farms. And there's a growing public awareness and support for um, composting community uh, from the community, from business, from government. And um, the movement is growing for composting. Um, all all different ages and 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 gr groups of people out there. COVID definitely helped um, bringing in especially um, small and medium scale composters, and and a lot of them have grown because people are interested in taking better care of their environment. Um, let's see here. Let's see if I can switch to the next slide. There we go. Um, it also is a way to connect food producers with um, food producers with with waste management systems, which are typically these siloed worlds, um, and and it can do that in sort of a non-threatening way because farms aren't necessarily com competing commercially in that waste management market. Um, so it's yeah. So I think that that there's a real potential there in many, many cases. Um, as our, the last presenter mentioned, she, she produces compost less expensively than she can purchase it. And I've found that to be the case, in, case in, in many cases where farms go into it thinking that they're gonna be um, selling most of their compost and find that they're actually using a lot more than they, than they anticipated. And, um, and by using the compost, you, know, you don't have to take on all that sales um, aspect of things, which can be very time-consuming and um, and costly, and and lastly, um, you know, it's a way to connect the community with farms. Um, so, just an example here on the left is uh, is Sunrise Farms carbon management facility. It's a it's a solar-powered aerated static pile system. They're also powering, I think they're selling power back to the grid. So they took the roof, installed solar panels, um, and they call it their carbon management facility because they're both um, offsetting carbon um, and, and making carbon for their soil um, through their compost. Just here's a couple pictures of their system, their aerated static pile system. They've got a nifty electric fence that they that is solar powered that's um, to keep keep critters away. They um, have I think a 400 person 400 family CSA, and their CSA members bring food directly to them, and they compost it on site. And most of the compost is going to be used in their greenhouse production. This is in White River Junction, Vermont. Um, so just an example of how they've how they've just closed the loop really tightly. On their own farm and with their own customers, um, and 
another caveat to all this is, you know, there is no best way to compost. Um, there are lots of different ways to compost. There are wrong ways to compost. It's creating issues, pollution issues, neighbor issues, um, contamination. Um, but there are a, a, a whole lot of options out there. Um, and so my presentation is really going to be about, um, yeah, I mean, a, a, about best management practices, about understanding how one can approach materials and recipe from a million different scenarios that, you know, all, uh, hopefully I cover a lot of the scenarios that um, you out there are, are thinking about. <clears throat> and let's see, I think I skipped two slides there. Um, I am going to be talking about managed composting, which to me is, um, means having a planned compost system with adequate, adequate capacity. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about planning for capacity knowing knowing the character and how much you know the the raw materials you're working with in terms of their its character it, the volumes you're handling um, using some form of a recipe um, blending materials together containing putrescible or potentially odorous or a uh, material that might be attractive to critters monitoring um, turning and aerating heat treatment so it's getting the compost hot enough to be killing pathogens and weed seeds um, preventing nu nuisances obviously odors vectors pollution uh, and mature maturing the compost long enough that you're ensuring a, um, a high quality product and so you know bringing intention um, and management to the process speeds up the decomposition process um, it's in a it, in a lot of different ways, but when you bring air into the system, the microbes are just more active. Um, that's that's one of the main ways that happens. Um, you're also improving the conservation of nutrients. We'll talk more about that in terms of carbon and nitrogen and that balance. Um, you're mitigating pollution, uh, pollution and dealing with pathogens, potential pathogens, and there's global impacts um, in terms of the return of carbon, nitrogen, other nu nutrients, um, keeping them within the, the natural system and the ecosystem. And so one of the things that we focus on in managed composting is, you know, is the presence of oxygen, trying to bring oxygen into the system. Um, we're trying to foster the aerobic microbes that, that need and, and love oxygen and that are the most efficient microorganisms in terms of their fast and complete decomposition. Um, there's a much wider range of biological diversity in that aerobic group um, and they drive high temperatures, the, the, um, the temperatures needed to kill pathogens and weed seeds and they are generally much better at breaking down odors um, and not causing odors um, so they so so um, yeah so they play a role on that nuisance end of things and when we talk about aerobic compost generally aerobic and composting systems is defined between 5 and 15 percent oxygen and then there's this semi aerobic range between 2.5 and 5 percent oxygen and it's um, it's important I you know my understanding has has developed over the years in terms of thinking you know really the, the composting process is not entirely aerobic i mean there's there's what we might call it i mean the cores of these particles simply can't oxygen can't make its way in there and so what's happening is in on these surfaces of particles we're trying to provide as much air as we can um and that's where the moisture is that's where the decomposition is happening and slowly um, but surely more and more of the material itself is becoming aerobic. Um, <clears throat> so, so this is this sort of understanding of what that, that pore space is, the interstitial space spaces um, between the particles is really critical from a recipe perspective. Oh, there, my arrow started working. And, and um, compost does provide some aeration. Bob Rink talked a lot about this. And um, with, with, with 
a, a good porous mix that heat rising can pull in air. Um, and so we're trying to foster that natural uh, um, convection and diffusion of oxygen because um, unless you have a forced air system, um, turning the compost is a very short-lived um, way to aerate the compost. Uh, if you're measuring oxygen in a, in a really active compost pile, uh, it, it, you're, you're getting down into that semi-aerobic -aer zone after a turn in 15 or 20 minutes. It just, the microbes are so, um, they use the oxygen so fast. And so that's where that porosity in the mix really becomes critical to, to keeping some air moving um, and moving the process along faster. Um, cost, uh, turning, turning more frequently is also just really costly and, and laborsome, and it's, and it's just not necessary um, in my opinion. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I think I skipped over the, the uh, outline of the presentation, but I'm gonna be talking about recipe and feedstocks for on-farm composting, handling feedstocks, um, preparing feedstocks, um, integrating food scraps, and then a little bit about capacity. So starting with recipe and feedstocks for on-farm composting. What are we doing? What are we, when we talk about a recipe, we're talking about blending materials together. And what we're trying to do is balance um, <clears throat> mainly protein with carbon, um, much like we do for in our own diets. Um, carbon, uh, protein, is is higher high nitrogen and and protein degrades down into these more available forms you're familiar with like ammonia um, <clears throat> and obviously some feedstocks have plenty of ammonia to start but generally as these things are breaking down even as the microbes are decomposing you there it's this protein that is um, that is cycling and going through these nit nitrogen cycles and releasing nitrogen. And so we're trying to balance that that nitrogen, keep it in the system. That's what we talk. That's what we're really talking about when we talk about the C to N ratio. We're trying to balance wet material with dry material um, to get to the target range of um, between 50 and 60 percent moisture is generally the the ideal range considered the ideal range. Um, Dense material, we're trying to bulk it up. We're trying to um, create porosity. And we can create recipes in a number of different ways. Trial and error is one way. Um, using analysis of, of the raw materials and doing some calculations with a recipe calculator is another way. It takes a lot of the guesswork out. Um, <clears throat> Blending materials is really important to having an effective compost recipe, and then also um, dilution. It's not it's not a parameter that's necessarily um, that you see much in in the composting literature, um, but I've been talking about it more and more because I think I think um, really, especially when you're managing putrescible materials, um, food scraps, you know, butcher residual, that sort of thing. It's it's it, a lot of it is actually about the dilution, just containing it and surrounding it with materials um, so that it can effectively break down. Um, and so, so it's a really it's a really key factor. <clears throat> so, I'm gonna um, talk about those parameters a little bit more from a recipe perspective, and then talk about the raw materials themselves and, and how we can use those, um, how they factor into the recipe. The, um, <clears throat> so the carbon in the process is providing the energy. That's the role of carbon in our, on our planet, right? It's, it's, it's energy, it's the, um, uh, uh, brought in through photosynthesis and cycled through the ecosystem and the food, the food chain. Uh, nitrogen is used to build proteins. And so when, a, when a, with a high C to N ratio, um, considered above 30 to 40 parts carbon to one part nitrogen, well above that, what happens is nitrogen becomes limiting in that microbes cannot replicate. They can't build enough proteins to replicate and consume the available carbon. So that's what we're really talking about when we're talking about um, C to N ratio is, is um, 
is creating this balance between the, the population of microbes and the carbon that's available for them to consume. And when you get it into that 25 to 30 to one um, target, that happens, it happens fast, less nitrogen is lost, um, but you're not extending the process out too far. Um, and obviously, uh, so what's happening is CO2 is being released through the respiration, through the, um, the metabolism of the carbon. And um, both carbon and nitrogen are being lost back to the atmosphere, but carbon is being lost at a much higher rate than the nitrogen. Um, so generally speaking, um, it's, it's, it's coming to that, towards that um, stoichiometric balance of 12, 13 to one C to N ratio for an, a healthy ideal soil. This is the, um, this is ab above 15 to one C to N ratio in a finished compost, um, less and less nitrogen is available to plants below 15 to one and down towards that 12 to one, a lot more nitrogen is available. So um, that's another reason why this, why this, this starting rate, it sort of, sort of gets cut right around in half. And so if I'm looking at a finished compost analysis that's above 15 to one, um, it may not be finished, but assuming it is pretty mature, I can um, almost guarantee that the C to N ratio started out maybe a little bit higher than it needed to be. Um, so this this is a little bit out, outdated research, but even back in, in 1956, you know, they were looking at the important role of, of balancing carbon and nitrogen and composting. And um, so on the left, you have C to N ratios, and on the right, you have the percent of the nitrogen that's lost. And you can see below that 25 at 22, 20, you know, that the rate of nitrogen loss is going up dramatically um, at 20. Uh, I, I've, re I've more recently been told that even at sort of in that ideal range, you're probably losing more like 10 or 15% of the nitrogen. I think the science is just advanced, um, but it's, it's, um, there is certainly that carbon's there to, to tie up and to build those microbial populations. That's where we want that nitrogen is in the, is in the living proteins of the organisms. That's where it becomes stable. Um, <clears throat> and um, now on to, to moisture content. So we're targeting between 50 and 65 um, percent moisture in, in, in the mix. Um, between 55 and 60 is where I generally aim towards on as a starting point, um, unless you're in a really, really wet environment um, or in you know the dead of winter, really snowy winter that you may wanna go more in the 50% range, so things will heat up faster. Um, but, um, but certainly in drier climates, you know, even going on the, towards the 65% makes a lot of sense. Um, but just like conceptually, um, I talk a lot, I present a lot about food scrap composting. So assuming that you've got a thousand pounds of, of food scraps, which is about a half, you know, um, it's a half ton, it, it's, it's roughly a cubic yard of food scraps and they are starting out at 80% moisture, that's 80, 800 pounds of water. And so in order to bring the moisture content down, um, we need to, to um, <clears throat> down into the ideal range, you know, a quarter of that moisture needs dry matter to absorb it. That's really the, that's really the concept we're going for. It's there's an intuitive part to this, but um, but this is also what a recipe calculator can can provide is, is, is a, um, a faster, more accurate representation. What are we talking about when, what does 60% moisture look like? And this is more of like a, a squeeze test for active composting where you can get a handful and things are really well blended and started to break down. If you can get a small handful, squeeze as hard as you can. You're just looking for slight glistening between your fingers. That's 60% moisture. That's That's the target for active composting um, it, from my experience. Um, the 
And the reason why I, I, I say on that higher edge is because compost dries out really fast when it's hot. It just, it, it dries out really, really fast. Um, <clears throat> so the, um, yeah, if, it, if you're getting dripping, that's generally considered above 65% moisture content. If you squeeze compost as hard as you can, you can't get any dripping or glistening, but it does conform into a ball when you open your hand. That's in that 50 to 60% range. And um, it's not below 50% at least. And then if it's too, too dry to stay in a ball, that's 50% moisture. And and it's hard to do the squeeze test with a with a fresh recipe, but this is sort of just to give some concept of what those moisture contents look like in practice. Um, <clears throat> bulk density is the weight of a particular volume of material. Um, and so C to N ratio, moisture content, and bulk density are the three parameters that we calculate when we do recipe calculations they tend to be the things that we focus on um, so in general materials that are have a weight of above um a thousand twelve hundred pounds per cubic yard um will require a lighter material to balance when you think about you know why materials might be really heavy or really light in the center here um, is 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 high bulk density. So um, high moisture content obviously raises the weight. Low organic matter or materials that have a lot of mineral are much heavier than high organic matter materials. And then um, <clears throat> materials that have very little porosity also tend to have a high bulk density. So if you're dealing with high bulk density, can be looking to any one of those things in a raw in the raw materials um, <clears throat> could be the could be the result of any one of those things. <clears throat> when, so when thinking about just general um, the feed stocks that are out there, and I'm going to come back to this a little bit more in more detail. But um, there's there are food scraps or food residuals coming from residences, commercial restaurants. That sort of thing, institutional schools, um, hospitals, um, and then food processing residuals, so materials that are coming from sort of food manufacturing. There's obviously agricultural materials, so uh, bedding materials, manures, spoiled feed, um, <clears throat> leaf and yard waste, ground up leaf and yard waste, which tends to be sort of a pretty balanced C to N ratio, actually, because it's just a mixture of everything that came onto a, 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 a municipal site, um, typically, and wood chips. And then I have cannabis in here just because that's in a lot of up, up here in Massachusetts, that's a growing thing. There's a lot of um, organic materials um, in terms of the growing media and also the, the plant material itself. Um, that is actually not finding a great home right now. So um, there may be opportunities there, although that's a whole subject in, in into itself. Um, <clears throat> and when we're classifying materials, there's the sort of typical green and brown materials, the high nitrogen and the high carbon materials. Um, I've found it helpful to think about materials um, also in terms of that there are neutral materials, recipe neutral materials that are starting out right in that 25 to 30 to one C to N range. Examples would be hay, um, a lot of bedded manures, um, not too well bedded, but, um, but decently bedded. Um, some food scraps, like a lot of just veg vegetable materials are sort of in that neutral range. Um, and so those are materials you can add as much as you want to. They aren't gonna, um, in, in terms of not throwing off the C to N ratio, they may need dilution or they may create other issues, moisture, that sort of thing. But um, from a C to N perspective, they will, they'll neither 
um, balance out high nitrogen materials or high carbon materials. But once you get those two things in a balance, you can add as much as you want and it, and it can act, act as a buffer and it can act as a good dilutant. Um, or these materials just simply on their own can, can work really well, um, <clears throat> assuming the other factors are, are good. And then there's these bulking agents, these porous materials that, um, and, and, and so as just a general rule, and this is more for um, folks who are composting food scraps and need a good amount of dilution, um, I say it's generally about one part by volume of the high nitrogen, one to two parts of the high carbon, one to two parts of a neutral material, um, and then a half to one part of a bulking agent like wood chips, a really porous material that can add that, um, that air space. And so if we're calculating a recipe, we're gonna be identifying what's the primary ingredient, what's the material we're trying to so, um, sort of solve for and balance. Uh, it could be food scraps, butcher residual, manures, um, leaf and yard waste, grass. Um, <clears throat> it, there, there's, um, there are calculations that you know one could do by hand if you're interested in understanding the math. It's certainly um, it's more of an academic. Um, exercise at this point, but and like this is the math that's in the on farm composting handbook. But um, more likely, you're going to be um, using a recipe calculator. You can download one for free off my website and find um, a nice video that we did back when I was at Highfield Center for Composting about how to use the recipe calculator. Um, <clears throat> there's also a, a, a Another free resource that we put together with the Agency of Natural Resources in Vermont about developing what I call analytically based recipes. So it's recipes that sort of are calculated and, and based on um, analysis of the raw material. This is just what the recipe calculator looks like. So you can put in your different materials and um, add in what the, what the moisture content, the carbon, nitrogen, bulk density are, and then adjust your volumes to, to calculate out. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, I, I wish that I had time to actually just play with one for you guys, because it, it really um, is enlightening. But, um, but I, yeah, I, I encourage you to, to check it out if this is something that interests you. Um, there is a lot that, the calculator can't tell you. Obviously, you got to work with these materials. Um, it doesn't necessarily tell you whether or not a material is is porous or will remain porous throughout its its life cycle. Um, it may have a really high or low bulk density, meaning it's really light, um, and it and it may be too porous, or it may that porosity may go away instantly. Um, so. We, we need to create recipes that have some sort of stable structure and um, can stack or aren't just going to slump like a, you know, a dairy, a very wet dairy manure, for example, um, doesn't have much structure on its own. Um, and <clears throat> does, is the readily available, available carbon? So um, when we talk more about the raw materials, we'll talk about different forms of carbon in feedstocks, but um, just an example, a really old manure that has been, um, you know, is, is six months old, has already lost a lot of that carbon. A lot of it has been de uh, um, metabolized already. And so it, it, it could suppress a recipe. You can't expect an old, mature, mat an old material like that to provide any energy to the recipe. Um, so it won't heat. And then there's uh, materials, their character changes, their moisture content changes, that things, things are, are constantly um, changing out there in the world. And so it can be wet, it can be dry, manures come in based on sort of the environment. Um, <clears throat> larger particles are typically less absorbent. So wood chips, for example, um, may look really dry on an analysis, but they, but water will just drain right through them. So um, they're not they're not generally as absorbent. You can also have um, 
materials that look really dry, like this is a, a, a sugar sand niter. It's, it's diatomaceous earth that's used for filtering maple syrup and has a really low moisture content, but um, it's diatomaceous earth. So it, it doesn't absorb <laughs> water at all. Um, it, so, it's, so it's really not helping to balance things. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> using recipes in the field, this is an example specific to, to food scraps, but the trying to figure out, what you're trying to do is figure out a, a, a volumetric ratio, right? Of sort of from whatever your primary material is to the other materials. So the recipe down here um, is one part food scraps, three part leaves, one part horse manure and a half part wood chips. Um, if I knew that I had a truckload of food scraps coming in and that truckload was eight tons and that on average um, a, a cubic yard of food scraps weighed a thousand pounds, then that, so that's 16,000 pounds of food scraps or 16 cubic yards. So I'd multiply all these other materials by 16 to kind of know how much material I'm trying to blend together. Um, and then generally I'm trying to keep a record of what I blended together in some sort of pile tracking documents and I can follow it through its life. Um, I'm gonna jump a little bit more into sort of materials, um, qualities of compostable materials. So just thinking about carbon, it's in, in our analysis, it's, it's measured as, um, um, as a percent weight. And for recipe calculations, we use the dry weight, the percent um, once the water is removed. And carbohydrates, uh, simple sugar, um, those that's considered the low hanging fruit. Um, so so feedstocks that have a lot of a lot of available carbohydrate that'll break down really fast. Um, food scraps, um, manure, sort of green any green parts of plants um, break down really fast, right? Um, cellulose is is um, what makes up the cell walls of plants and <clears throat> Um, we think of it as sort of dietary fiber. And so it's, that's the dietary fiber, fiber part of, of our diet. Um, it's also microbes can access it and break it down really fast. So thinking like, hey, straw, leaves, paper, um, not as fast as like the sugars, the carbohydrates, but they're, they're, they're um, metabolizing it into those things. There's all these secondary plant compounds um, that are somewhat accessible. Um, some of them aren't, but most of them are can be broken down, but they take longer. So that's you're gonna have a lot more of that in bark, woody materials, um, leaves. And then on to lignin. So this is wood, um, the woody kind of structural form of carbon. Um, that is a secondary cell wall. Um, and it takes a lot longer to break down. And that um, generally fungi are playing, are best at playing that role in breaking down um, lignin and, and woody materials. And so, you know, people who are trying to make a more fungal compost, fungally rich compost and diverse uh, um, biologically diverse composts are going to want a little bit of that in there. Um, so, so it's woody, woody materials. Hey James, uh, yeah. just wanted to flag that we have just over half an hour left. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> so nitrogen, we're talking about um, the weight of nitrogen. Uh, sorry, so nitrogen is the um, the protein side of things um, and <clears throat> so proteins are are um, the higher the protein content the higher the nitrogen level in general in general and, and, and again this is the part of the of the um, the recipe that is going to be driving that microbial population 
So this is just sort of a graphic showing where things fall. If you think about neutral, neutral materials as being right in that 25 to 30 to one ratio. Um, you know, cow bedding can be as high as 30, even 40 to one. It's generally, that's the, uh, that's the younger cows, the heifers, the calf manure. Um, grass is very high nitrogen, chicken bedding, um, pig, pig manure, very high nitrogen. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about those things. And, you know, when should you have a feedstock analyzed in a lab? It, it's, um, <clears throat> that is, it's really up to you, but it's when, it's when you think that you can, um, you can't really trust the book values or you're just kind of shooting in thin air in terms of what, you know, what you might be dealing with. There can be this huge variation. Let's say you're doing a horse manure. Well, I've seen analysis of horse, horse bedding, bedded horse manure um, that ranges between 30 to 1 C to N ratio and 90 to 1 C to N ratio. Um, and so it's generally sort of on the neutral to high carbon side of things. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily know that even after years of sampling a lot of these materials. So um, yeah, it, it, sampling can take the guesswork out. Um, you can also find book values. These are um, values that are in my book. The on-farm composting handbook has a, has a great table um, that can be downloaded for free online. Um, so this is just what you'd see in, in my book. You've got bulk density, you've got percent solids, uh, moisture content, C to N ratio, a lot of what's on that analysis. <clears throat> you want to make sure you're getting a representative sample, ideally, you know, digging in with a tractor into a pile of manure and getting sort of from both the inside and the outside, doing a composite sample. We generally say around 20 um, subsamples all blended together and getting it out to a lab. Here's a list of, of um, the <coughs> labs that are S STA certified to the, um, that use the test methods, uh, the TMECC protocols, which is sort of a uniform standard across the US. <clears throat> particle size is really critical. Really fine particles, think about it like clay, right? They, it clumps together. Whereas um, medium and large particles can, can create some pore space, and that pore space is where is where the microbes are active. So really, ideally, you're having a diversity of different particle sizes. Really large particles. We'll talk a little bit about carcasses in a minute. Um, tree limbs, you know, they're not going to break down in a compost pile. Um, carcasses will, but tree limbs won't. It'll take longer, right? Because um, they're going to have that anaerobic core. So this, here's just an example of all these different you know, sizes. Generally, over two inches is not needed. Um, in some particles within that one to two inch range um, are really good at creating that pore space. <clears throat> then sort of what's the structural integrity and it's you know a lot of this stuff is 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 especially intuitive to farms farmers are out there you know you know how long things to break down it's it's intuitive but this is just kind of giving a different lens maybe to um <clears throat> from which through which to view it from a composting perspective um so um yeah so the structural integrity refers to how prone a material is to decomposition. This has a lot to do with C to N ratio, actually. Um, the lower the C to N ratio, generally the faster things break down, both in the field and in the compost pile. Um, and, but we need, we were looking for some of those, a small percentage, five, 10, 15% of the larger um, uh, structural particles. Organic matter is the, um, obviously, is the opposite of a volatile solids content. Organic matter is the, is also associated with carbon. So that's, that's the driving energy. Any a material that has very low organic matter, like uh, clay or soil, for example, will suppress the process because it's not compostable. It's, you know, it is the opposite of compostable. Um, it certainly gets blended in with the with the organic matter, 
But um, so that can be used as a way um, to suppress the process somewhat um, or buffer the process. But it is, um, but it's, yeah, those materials, materials with high volatile solids don't drive the process in terms of the um, heat at least. <clears throat> pH can affect a recipe. And, and, and the thing to know about pH is we're just, we're, we're watching out for things that are on the really, really low end of things or the really, really high end of things because microbes don't generally like, at least diverse microbes don't, can't really survive at that, at those edges. There are some, but it's very specific types. Um, on a high alkaline side of things, nitrogen is also lost much faster, um, particularly at high temperatures, you're losing a lot of nitrogen. On the low end of the scale, um, that's associated with organic acid formation and odors. So some of the worst odors that I've encountered have been in um, when something really putrescible like food scraps has been composted with uh, coffee chaff, for example. Um, someone, they were assuming that it was on the sort of the dry matter side of things, but it just, the combination just created a really, a really big problem. Um, so yeah, so, so that's something to watch out for. Um, I think, I think I just covered this slide. <clears throat> Salt. Um, <clears throat> it's, it's obviously, you know, toxic to plants and is found in a lot of animal and human food on, on your lab analysis. You'll see it's measured on a scale of electrical conductivity. Um, above most tests use this millimoles per centimeter scale and um, finished compost really soil that is above five millimoles is um, can be harmful to plants compost that's above five millimoles just really has to be diluted um, and 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 that it can be common for like a food scrap compost or even a, a like a dairy manure compost to be a, above that um, so, so it's, you know, in potting mixes, that sort of things, um, like high dosage applications of compost, that's where that could be a problem. Um, <clears throat> so there's also something recently called the compost ag index, which is really interesting. I don't think I actually have the source here, but um, it's, it, it's a way of testing for the specific salt because many salts are, are plant nutrients, they're, they're good. It's sodium and chloride that you're generally um, concerned about. And so you can test for those specifically and sort of break out those salts into their different components and, um, and then use that as a slightly more um, accurate gauge of whether or not the compost is gonna be harmful to plants. <clears throat> so feedstock sourcing and handling here. Um, I am coming back to this list that we already covered, and I just wanted to talk a little bit more about. Um, for one, you know, food scraps come with <laughs> with uh, risk and reward. Um, the risk we'll talk a little bit more about, but the potential reward is that there are are tipping fees. Um, um, people will generally pay composters to receive all different types of food residuals. Um, Agricultural um, beddings, spoiled uh, feed, that sort of thing. In some places, people get paid to take a horse manure. I mean, a lot of it's ending up in the landfill. Um, but it's um, so so that could be something that one could charge for. Oftentimes, in more agricultural communities, it's much more um, highly valued material, and so sometimes it. Um, People will give it to you just if you're willing to pay to haul it away, that sort of thing. Um, you know, being careful not to, um, um, just being cautious about approaching farms out there and knowing that, you know, they may actually charge something um, for a manure. And um, there's, um, oh, I just put a note in here that, you know, the, the, for those of you ha who have livestock and are composting and maybe are needing to bring carbon into the process, um, why not 
stay, you know, why not get that into the um, using using that carbon as a bedding first and getting kind of that dual usage out of it. And then it's already nice and blended in with manure. And then, um, you know, and then when it goes out versus just adding it at the, um, <clears throat> at the once it gets out into the field. And so obviously that depends on the animal and the material, but um, generally people get paid to take leaves. Um, okay. Um, grinding is expensive. <laughs> grinding mm -hmm. is, is something that's usually happening, at least in, for yard trimmings, is happening at municipal sites. What some farms will do is basically stockpile yard trimmings for a year and then bring in a grinder or they may you know get have some sort of arrangement with the municipality where the municipality will pay for the grinder to come in and um, grind it all up if they're willing to to deal with it um, <clears throat> so there's also a um, there can be a cost for wood chips um, sometimes oftentimes it's free but in in places where um, there's a market for wood chips for energy and bedding, sometimes there is a cost for that. Um, generally, people can get paid to be taking this this cannabis waste um, if folks are either required to compost it or willing to pay for it. Um, so as I just referenced, carbon materials are um, in high demand in many places because of their value as an energy source. Um, obviously any bedding material is highly valuable, sawdust, wood shavings, that sort of thing, really benefits the compost to have it in with those manures. Um, <clears throat> but there's a cost there. And um, so it really takes, um, it, it, it takes some um, resourcefulness, you know, in terms of sourcing carbon materials in particular. Um, the, the yard waste leaves, that sort of thing, are the most likely source of either a no cost or a paying carbon material. Um, it's uh, particularly in, in uh, more urban, suburban areas. But some other sources you can be looking for, these highly bedded manures, um, shredded paper that's clean, leaves, sawdust, wood chips. There's a website called Get Trip Chip Drop. You can put your farm on on there and people can come, you let them know where they can dump it and they can come dump it there um, and connect with you that way. Um, and food processing residuals, I put this in here just because as I said before, a lot of food processing residuals are actually a carbon source. Potato chips, cranberries, uh, you know, there's a lot of them um, that are actually on the carbon side of end of, th end of things, not the high nitrogen end, end of side of things, but they still require dilution, um, but they're not gonna require additional carbon necessarily to get them to break down. Um, let's see here. <clears throat> so in terms of Pre-processing of feedstocks. This was an interesting one. Um, that um, I there as far as the topic of like what materials might require pre-processing. Um, most you know most don't require equipment uh, in, in general. Um, but some examples like this is a a um, a belt press that presses dairy manure. Um, and creates, you can see on the left here, that pile there is what comes out. It's, um, it's very fibrous and has a perfect C to N ratio um, and feels light and fluffy, but it has the moisture is about 70%. And they actually use that manure um, to generate heat and they pump hot water, hot, hot glycol actually into this old farm, farm tractor radiator and, and heat their, um, their press room with it. So um, it's kind of a cool little loop they've created through their composting process and capturing that heat. Um, hey James, yeah. just wanted to flag yep. we have about 20 minutes left. I'm um, just making sure uh, discussion of food scraps. Still on yeah, we get, 
Yeah, I think we're almost to the discussion of these guys. Um, let's see here. So, um, yeah, here's another type of, 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 this is a screw press. So these are, these are manure separators. Um, and the value here is in, um, you know, removing that moisture is dealing with a high moisture material requires some, um, some sort of dry matter to, to balance it out to get it to work. And so by removing the moisture mechanically, you can actually reduce the overall footprint and, and increase the, um, or decrease the cost of sort of, of processing because it's just a, a lot less materials required. Um, <clears throat> here's, a, here's a farm in Western Mass, Martin's farm. This is Adam Martin. And in the background, you can see he's got a, um, <coughs> a mechanical grinder and it's like a large scale grinder and he's the only, he's the only farm actually that I know of um, and composter that I know of that grinds up all his food and basically uses that as his mixer it's a it's an expensive way to go about it but one of the one of the justifications in his mind is it, it's allowed him to take in um, cardboard and grind up the cardboard and make this, um, and he gets paid to take the carbon, cardboard, so he's getting paid to take the carbon, and it's, you know, and it requires this pre-processing step, but um, it's a, it's an interesting system, but generally, I know, food scraps aren't, aren't ground up, that's not a step that needs to be taken, they'll break down just fine in the compost, um, so, <clears throat> In terms of you know just what to accept on the feedstock um, side of things, the questions that I'm I would encourage you to ask is sort of how much control you have over the source, um, how much let's see get, do you insist anticipate it being a consistent and clean source, so you're not going to take a phone call every week to get it to you, um, how much education will it require? to get a clean material with the generator? Um, will they commit to supplying it to you? Um, will the value derived from the feedstock um, cover the cost of proper management? So this is a question of, if you're taking food scraps onto your farm um, and you're getting paid a very little amount, then you know, you're not gonna have as much, you're not gonna have as much ability to man manage that well. You're not gonna be able to bring on as many other materials to dilute it. Um, just overall, the ability to manage the material goes down. Also, um, being, having to pay for any contamination that's removed, all that equipment. So it's getting, you know, getting that balance point is key. And obviously any material that has odor potential um, is increasing risk. So I'm actually gonna probably skip over a lot of this, but um, just just see what um, this is. I think this is an important slide that I wanted to cover um, because contamination is a big, big issue in composting, and um, you know all different materials, but especially for food scraps. And it's and it's a, and it can be a big cost that composters sort of inherit. But it's ultimately there's, you know, it's whoever's generating that material that should be paying that cost, you know, and, and, and one of the ways and, and prevention and education is, in my opinion, the, the least expensive way to handle that contamination um, and the correct place to, you know, to sort of make that investment. And it, and it can be a, more of a public investment versus uh, you know a farm a private farm having to do that um on you know if if uh, if a material is is coming in and, and the generators aren't well educated on source separation then you're you know the whoever's doing that collection is, is taking the risk of having a refused load when they drop off the material if it's too contaminated nope we won't take it they might they'll have to pay more in tipping fees or they might have to be paying for decontamination and so that risk and that cost is um, can get sort of pushed down, pushed up um, to the composter. There's a financial risk of you know having a mountain of trash that needs to get the pay to remove. Um, it can be definitely a, a reduction in product value. Um, 
And ultimately, composters who aren't dealing with that contamination are passing that on to you know wherever that material is going. Um, so that's so that means our planet is paying that cost. Um, <clears throat> so I'm gonna skip through some of this stuff. Um, let's see here and move on to um, make sure we cover. Let's see. Oops. Um, <clears throat> some more of the handling stuff re regarding food scraps. So um, blending materials, as I mentioned before, is is critical. Um, so getting getting all those different types of materials mixed in together. Um, <clears throat> sometimes operators layer the materials. You won't get as good as fast breakdown. Um, you won't get as um, as good odor control. So food scraps are often blended with a with a loader bucket. Um, this is a small uh, TMR mixer. They come in all different sizes, but these are familiar to many farmers. These are feed mixers. Um, manure spreaders do a really good job, particularly with materials. I don't recommend this for food necessarily, but for other materials, you know, you do horizontal layering of your of your feedstock and then put it through the manure spreader. It makes, does a great job. Um, and then you can kind of stack it up into a pile. Um, sorry, I'm skipping through this. Um, when you're creating a pile, you want to make sure that you are um, <clears throat> putting material together of like age. And so a batch of compost, um, generally I, I recommend starting a new batch every um, at most every six to eight weeks so that you're not adding a lot of new material to old material that we'll, we'll be finishing up. Otherwise, you're really managing parts of piles that are in really different stages. Um, <clears throat> I did want to just take a note about mortality composting because I guess this came up in one of the past presentations and um, really just point you to these resources down here um about you know there's a lot of great resources about composting animals um it's a well you know it's a it's a, it's a well studied practice the key is getting you know surrounding creating this envelope around it um of first dry dry enough materials to absorb it as it starts to break down and then highly active materials of uh, like a blend a blend of something um, you know, horse manure would, be, would do a great job. Active compost would do a great job. Um, the bones, you know, they, they, they'll need to be screened out just like any other sort of large material um, and maybe put back through the process or, or kept aside. So managing food scraps, I think I'm almost done. Wow, time is flying. Um, um, in general, you know, we're, we want to be managing food scraps for moisture and, and it's important to recognize that even though an apple doesn't look like water, it, it it's, there's a lot of water in there. And so as the cell walls start to break down, it releases moisture. Um, so typically three to five units of, of those balancing, um, materials are required with food scraps. Um, having a good place to work and blend material. Um, so what I would call a receiving bay, ideally it's a concrete area that has um, where you can work with a loader to blend up that material. Um, <clears throat> you want uh, something to push against and a uh, for someone who's really seriously doing a lot of food scraps, having a docked tip off of helps to kind of contain the materials because you know the eight tons of food is is a lot and it will it it um spreads <laughs> uh here's just an example of that tipping dock here um i'm gonna just show this quick video here hopefully i don't know how well you'll be able to see it it'll be a little jumpy but here he is um dumping food scraps into a carbon trough so putting down a nice dry bed of materials with some edges just formed with a rake will contain the food scraps and um, 
basically just allow you to keep everything nice and clean. <clears throat> Blending of food scraps breaks down odors faster. It initiates that hot temperature um, and will create a much more uniform end product faster. It's important to maintain these areas because they can, they, you're working a lot back and forth. This is where the concrete comes in, but if you don't have concrete, um, a nice packed gravel area can work. Um, trying, trying your best to keep it, keep it level, make, make sure it's draining moisture away. Otherwise, you really can be operating in a mud pit. Here's an example of a receiving area that needs to be replaced. Um, keeping food scraps, just cleaning up really um, is going to prevent vectors, animals from from coming on. Um, and let's see here. So really important, immediately incorporate food scraps into piles, then cover them with compost. Um, and and that will both that will avoid odor generation and it'll also avoid attracting animals. Um, and so what that looks like is what we call capping. It's um, it is taking a, a, a nice sort of uh, porous material and covering up that raw food material. Um, this is a nice like semi-finished compost going over a, a fresh blend. Um, you want to use porous yet absorbent. So what that's doing is 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 as odors are are being released, it's sort of acting as a sponge and a microbial sponge where the microbes can break down those odors because they're great food. They're high in nitrogen. You want to keep them in the pile and allow them to degrade. Um, recipe neutral materials, pre-treated compost um, are great. So you can add as much as you need without worrying about throwing off the recipe. Um, talked a little bit about pile covers as another option. This is a um, this is a less expensive type of cover um, called as is a compost text. So it's like a it's kind of like a geotextile. This is a Gore-Tex cover. Or it's a Gore cover, but it's 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 produced by Gore-Tex, the company. These are much more expensive, but they actually um, contain odor really well. Um, um, <clears throat> I, I think, Linda, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I basically have two more minutes. So I think I, 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 I'm going to skip to the end and just... Um, yeah, I think if you could give the maybe some highlights for... Uh, Anything else you might want to touch on, and then we've got a lot of great questions that we want to get to. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I'm I am going to skip through this because I just don't think I can. I definitely overestimated my capacity to move through this. <laughs> just way too much to cover. Um, what I wanted to do here is just you know point out the on-farm composting handbook is great. Um, the field guide for on-farm composting. Um, Bob Rink, who presented first in this, in this, um, uh, has a new book, a new version of this updated. The um, I think it's just called the Composting Handbook, which I'm really excited about. Um, <clears throat> and then U.S. Compost Council BioCycle is now um, as is now has a website that just has an archive that is free for all this. Um, just stories and rich, rich information about composting. Um, this is my book, Community Scale Composting Systems, and um, this is this is it's a it's a pretty hefty resource, and especially for folks who are doing food scraps, um, it's it, it's pretty comprehensive in a way that there isn't much else out there that that's so focused on that um, yet. And um, I also wanted to just point out that this um, this is a new um, school that I'm launching. It's called the 131 School of Composting. And um, we you can go on there right now and just 
get on the get on the list, but we're going to have a um, a nationally available compost training that is kind of covering everything that I just covered and uh, and and much much more and kind of filling in those gaps. So I'm really excited about this, and I think we're going to have sessions starting um, either you know early early winter. So um, with that, I'm excited to answer questions and, and thank you all so much for those of you who um, are here. Awesome. Thank you, James. I'm just going to take over um, controls. But uh, while I do that, um, I'll give you the first question. Um, uh, there was someone who asked, they saw you mentioning both ratios by weight and volume in the a compost recipe development process. Which one do you think is best for recipe development? Mm -hmm. That's a really good question. Um, and so, so when we talk about weight, it, it could mean a couple of different things. You could talk about the weight of the raw materials, but what we're really trying to get to in the recipe development process, um, if you're going that analytical route, is is balancing the weight of the element of carbon and to the weight of the element of, of, of nitrogen. So that's a weight-based calculation. Um, and what, are, what a calculator, a recipe calculator allows you to do is take um, a, a volume unit, so a cubic yard of, of one material or a bucket load of one material. That's the great thing about a volumetric ratio is that you can choose any unit and you know as long as you're sticking with that unit or can convert units you can um, you can you can follow that recipe so it doesn't matter if it's a five gallon bucket or, or a tractor bucket um, as long as you're following that ratio by volume you should be getting the recipe right and um, and so what the calculator does is it, it converts volume units to those weights um, to the weight of the raw material and then to the weight of the carbon, the nitrogen, the moisture content. And that's that's what's happening. But ultimately, you want to be working on a volume basis, not a weight basis, because it's not a practical um, way to work. Awesome. Thank you. Um, then there's a couple of questions uh, relating to well, a few questions about food scraps um, and, and integrating them into the composting process. Um, any tips? I know this is often the case for at least um, some of the urban farmers we work with, but um, Bex, any tips for if you have only food waste, food scraps, I should say, and wood chips, if wood chips are your primary brown? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a, that's, that's a really good question. I mean, I think what my my gut reaction is um, <laughs> the, you, you don't actually just have two feedstocks there. You have a third feedstock. And one of the feedstocks, um, actually four, <laughs> you've got compost that is in process. Um, so you can be cycling back compost um, that say three months into the process and using that as, as a dilutant or as a capping material um or as a way to sort of um essentially just yeah really just dilute that material um with, i mean the challenge with just doing food scraps and wood chips is that the food scraps are going to break down really fast um really in a matter of weeks or months and but the and and the wood chips are going to take a year or better to, before they really fully break down and um and you're going to end up with and, and so if you screen out those wood chips, you're going to actually end up with a pretty uh, um, high nitrogen end material because the, the carbon in the wood chips just hasn't broken down. So then what you're doing is you is you want to be able to cycle those wood chips back through. And after they've been through the process once, their, their C to N ratio is going to be much more neutral and they'll break down a lot better the next time. So um, yeah, and so and so you can either be using compost that's in process and cycling it back or you can be using the wood chips after they've been screened out it's if you're not screening at the end then um yeah i'd be trying to i'd be trying to cycle back 
older compost into the newer compost to get it to break down so that by the end you're really um, getting a more finished product. Um, yeah. Great. Uh, there's a question about uh, whether uh, folks can stockpile their nitrogen greens or food scraps if they're mixed with carbon and leaves for a few weeks before adding them to the pile. I mean, yeah, I wouldn't use the word stockpile, but but, um, but I would I would say you know yes, as long as you're really I mean I I definitely try to get a blend. I mean, really, what you want to do you don't want that to be like festering and going really really anaerobic, um, but um, but if you can you can kind of like if you have a good area to be receiving that material, getting it blended, um, and then containing it in, in carbon materials or compost, you can be kind of stockpiling that material up for a few weeks and then get it out onto the, your active composting area, wherever that is. Um, that's, that's a pretty common practice actually, um, but it, it's, it's not great practice to just be receiving it, covering it up, the, a, a lot of you're just going to end up with a lot of leachate happening and um, odors and, and vectors and that sort of thing. So, um, um, yeah, there's you can also be doing that in, in like a some sort of container, um, depending on your scale, that may or may not be practical. Great. Um, yeah, that's something we definitely do not. Uh, we want people to try to avoid um holding food scraps uh without being blended appropriately for sure um there's a question about spent grains and hay and whether their source are carbon carbon or nitrogen um i spent grains are going to be a, a source of of carbon um and um and hay is going to be sort of right in that neutral cal category if it's young hay um then it then it would be more on the higher nitrogen side and probably you know 20 to 1 15 20 to 1 so that would be a nitrogen source but most like bed hay or or hay that you're going to find um for free out there in the world is going to be a um is going to be on the uh, sort of in that neutral side of things it's going to have lots of available carbon so it will heat up really well and it's usually dry enough that it's going to absorb. It's going to sort of act like a like a carbon material in terms of its ability to absorb moisture. Um, just another quick note um, is that there, you know, one of the things you might find out there are round bales of of hay that have you know rotted out in the field or or gone bad. And um, some of those TMR mixers can literally take one of those and just and and have blades and like cut it up. Um, so that can be a real good way because it's a pain. It's just really time consuming to deal with hay, especially round bales. Not practical unless you have some sort of equipment to do that with. Um, there's also bale splitters and bale shredders. And um, so, yeah, that, that is a feedstock that would require some pre-processing generally. Okay, well, one more question, um, but I have a feeling we're going to need to invite you back for another Q&A. Um, is uh, types of wood chips to avoid? Are there any, such as black elm pine, uh, black elm pine or walnut, um, like due to acidity? And is it okay to compost actual walnuts or things that come from the tree? And so on? yeah, I mean black walnut. It's generally recommended to avoid it um, because it it has some plant toxicity. I don't know at what concentration that sort of becomes not an issue um but just in you know just as a general rule of thumb um you know deciduous trees compost faster and better than evergreen trees like cedar pine that sort of thing they can take a lot longer like um two or three times as long in a lot of cases so um hardwoods are great um this pine, yeah, pine and that sort of thing does take longer. Not that it, you can't use it, but it, it it's just going to slow the process down somewhat. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, James. I think that's all we have time for at this moment in time. But uh, thank you all for participating. 
and uh, we will be following up with a link to the recording of this webinar. And uh, we hope to see you in a future webinar, but definitely have a great rest of the week. Thanks so much, Linda, everyone.